Psalm 34, get your hand up high while you're turning to Psalm 34. Turn also to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Two places in the Word today. Um, don't forget, we have Easter services coming up, and uh, you know this is probably one of the best times you can reach out to the unbelieving people in your life uh, because they're more open right now than they are at any other time of the year to come to church. Uh, but we also have an Easter egg hunt outreach uh, that we did last year. We're doing it again this year. Listen, we want to bless the congregation here, but this, um, don't get mad, but this really isn't for you. Um, it's for the lost people in the, in the city of Las Vegas. And, uh, uh, you know, I live out in Mountain's Edge, and they do an Easter egg hunt every year. And I'm telling you, thousands. I think they get like 10,000 people out to uh, hunt for Easter eggs. And so, you know, our thought is this. We don't care about Easter eggs. We really don't care about the hunt. Uh, we don't care about the prizes. We care about the gospel. And if people are going to come, if, if the unchurched people are going to come to something like that, why not do it? And uh, while we do it, why don't we share the gospel um, that really Easter is all about in the first place? So I want to encourage you. Uh, we do need a lot of help with this. We're going to be face painting. We're going to be making uh, balloon animals. Anybody have that spiritual gift? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 17. <laughs> we need field monitors, things like that. Uh, we're all, listen to this. We are also in need of candy, no chocolate. It's like a contradiction, isn't it? It melts in the egg. I'm, that's what I'm guessing. So um, be a part of that. Stop by the Connection Center. Uh, and then the last, the last thing I want to say today uh, before I say a whole bunch of other stuff is um, uh, we have an international ministry potluck after the second service. So if, who, ha who doesn't have plans for lunch today? Who does not have plans? Don't lie. Come on. No, none of you have plans for lunch. Raise your hand if you don't have plans for lunch. See, uh, you know you're just going to get trapped right now. Come and have lunch. Hang out with us. The food is awesome. The fellowship is better. Um, our missionaries are going to be there. I want you to get to know them. And, um, and, you know, they need to be financially supported as well. So encourage you to, uh, this is what you can do. Maybe you're going to spend 50 bucks. Watch me spend your money here today. You probably were going to sp spend like maybe 50 bucks on lunch. Save the money. We've got lunch for you. Okay. Save the money. Uh, have lunch here and then give that money to uh, our missionaries. Psalm 34. So, I know, I know someone's going to email me on that one. Psalm 34, let's all stand together. All right. Psalm 34, a psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. David says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Yeah. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, oh what? Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all, how many? And delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. I think David here is uh, not just talking autobiographically, but now talking to, about anybody who trusts in the Lord. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. What did, what did God do? And saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints. There's no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Father, we bless your name today. God, we are so thankful for your word, and, and, and we do. We with David, we say yes and amen. We thank you for not only all that you do in our lives, we thank you, God, for who you are. God, wash us and cleanse us. Father, we confess to you so often we fall short. But God, today we exalt you for your relentless, eternal love for us. And, and God, you never quit. You never give up. God, you never have failed us. 
And we don't expect you to because we know who you are. God, I pray that as we study your word this morning and as you graciously reveal yourself to us, that you would draw this congregation into corporate praise. God, that's, that's what we live for. We live to praise you and to give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat today. Well, listen, um, you know, when we started reading the psalm, uh, and, and I've, I've said this a number of times, so I'm not going to, like, say it uh, at great length again today, um, but the first part, the introduction, the introductory piece, was written by David as well. This wasn't added later on by scribes. Um, this was something that David wanted to make sure. It's not, it's not for naught. There's a purpose in what David shares here. And it, it, look, it's interesting, all right? I mean, you, you begin the reading of the psalm, and David himself, from an autobiographical perspective, David himself is, is communicating uh, to everyone who's going to be reading or singing this psalm, and there was uh, an intention that he had for the congregation of Israel, we'll see in just a minute, but he wanted everybody to know the backdrop. He wanted everyone to know the history. What was the history? Well, there was a point in time in David's life where he literally pretended to be a madman. He pretended insanity before Abimelech, who was the king over the Philistines, and the result of his pretending madness uh, was that ultimately Abimelech drove him away and, and sent him away, and there was deliverance that, that God gave. Now, um, this may be an unfamiliar story to you, because, you know, when we think of David, we're uh, more apt to be thinking about uh, the story of him conquering Goliath, um, or we think of one of the other military victories that, that God gave him, or we think about all of the psal psalms that he wrote. You know, we, we think of these other stories because, um, you know, I think that I think that they are easier to teach in children's ministry. I mean, you know, how do you put together a flannel graph of David pretending madness before the king of the Philistines? Um, I, it just doesn't really have a ring to it. You know, David pretended insanity. And, and uh, I want you to just check this out today. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Hang a left. It's not that far. You can do it today. Hang a left. Let me hear the Bible pages turn. Some of you are like, you're going to read it to us anyway. Why do we have to? Because I want your eyes on it. Hey, I want you to become familiar with the, with the Bible, uh, but, but I want you to remember, David at this point in time, uh, in this moment of his life, is a young man, he's been anointed by Samuel as the king, remember Samuel went to Bethlehem under the direction of God, and, and he held a, a, a feast, a sacrifice, Jesse and all of his sons came, all of his sons except one, uh, this little ruddy, young, good-for-nothing, worthless little dude was out shepherding the sheep. Um, and at the sacrifice, God had directed Samuel to anoint the next king because Saul's heart had drifted from the Lord. And so, you know, son by son, he goes through the house of Jesse and, you know, he's, he gets to the last son, he thinks, and he looks at Jesse and he's like, are there any more? And Jesse says, yeah, well, there's one, but, you know, he's really not even worth bringing. And... Uh, and so Samuel says, well, bring him anyway. And, you know, God was teaching Samuel a lesson. Don't look with the eyes of man. I, I don't look on the outside. I don't evaluate with, with uh, human criteria. I look on the inside. I look on the heart. David was the young man that God had chosen. And so he was anointed there. Um, and then, of course, you, you know the story with David. David conquered Goliath. Um, at that point in time, David came into the kind of into the house of Saul, and wherever Saul went out, David went, went out with him, and God had given David great favor. In fact, they were singing songs. The women of Israel were singing songs about David and Saul. Saul is slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. And Saul was watching as David was, was rising, and the anointing of God was on his life, and he was a man of wisdom, and he was granted great favor among the people. In fact, the Bible says that all of the people of Judah loved him, and uh, Saul was afflicted with a distressing spirit, and so there were times where David would come in. Not only was David a mighty warrior, but he was a sweet psalmist. I mean, he was gifted by God when he would play the lute or the instrument, and, and, he, and when he would sing, there was something that God would do, and Saul's um, heart, that soul that was afflicted would be eased by the work of the Holy Spirit through David's life, kind of like Pastor Tony, you know, when Pastor Tony leads us in worship, you know, don't you get ministered to? You can sense the power of God through his life. 
in a similar way, you know, with David. Well, all that time, Saul is be becoming jealous, and he recognizes that the favor of God is now on David's life and is departing from him, and Saul goes after David. Um, David's relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan, had become something I think that Saul was jealous of as well. And so Saul is after David. Saul is seeking to, to kill David. He's attempted to even murder him, and now David is on the run. David runs to a place, the, the least likely place that you would expect him to go. He goes to the city of Gath. He seeks refuge from Saul in the city of Gath. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is that a bad place for David to go? And the answer to that is because Goliath, the one that David had slain, was from Gath. I mean, this was the... Uh, this was the warrior that every Philistine was looking to. And so David had a reputation, and he rolls into the city of Gath. And this is how the story goes. Notice in verse 10, 1 Samuel 21. Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another and dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. So David rolls into the city and, and the, the servants of the king are like, we know this guy. We know him and he's got a reputation. And by the, repu by the way, the reputation is he's killed a lot of our people. Verse 12, now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So David knew he was in trouble. The word was out. Um, he assumed it was just a matter of time until he was surrounded, and, uh, and they took their revenge out on him. So what does David do? Verse 13, not the, not the uh, highest moment in David's life. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. <laughs> that classic? I mean... Have you ever pictured this? This is why this doesn't roll in children's ministry. Like, how do you do a flannel graph of that? David's playing the idiot. He's playing the fool. Um, he goes to the, the, the city gate, and he, he scratches on it. He claw, claws on it. He's making noises like an insane man. He's drooling down his beard. And this is what the king says, verse 14. Then Achish says to his servants, look, you see, the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you've brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Therefore, excuse me, David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adulam. So not the, you know, not the most significant moment in David's life. Probably not the moment that David is the most proud of. Not only does he roll into the city of Gath by himself, he rolls in with a the, the sword of, of Goliath. And David makes a number of mistakes here. Now, this is my position on what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 21. There are some who say, well, David was directed by God um, to go to the city of Gath. David was directed by God to play the insane man. We have no evidence of that in Scripture. Um, I don't think necessarily that David was in sin, but this was an error in David's life. David was operating in the flesh. He was, he was on the run. He was running from his issues. Not only was he running from his issues, he was running to the wrong place. Not only did he run to the wrong place, but instead of trusting God and really looking to the Lord and, and the Lord's way of delivering him, David looks to his own flesh. He plays the madman. I don't think this was really a moment for David to be proud of, right? I mean, as he's playing the fool. Probably something, I mean, if this was you, put yourself in David's shoes, you know, something you would be embarrassed of, something you would be ashamed of, something that you would want to sweep underneath the rug, something that you would want to forget, something that if people reminded you of and you were the king, you would kick them out of your kingdom. Like, just don't even talk to me about this again. This was not the best moment of my life as I was operating in the flesh um, but David doesn't do that. This is what's interesting to me. And, you know, I think you probably would agree with this. I think for all of us, there are moments in our lives where we operate in the flesh and we step out and we try to resolve our issues in our own strength. It doesn't, doesn't glorify God. 
And yet at the same time, God, in the midst of all of it, is still faithful. You know, there are times where we just want to forget those moments. Anybody have one of those moments in their life? You ever, you ever make a mistake and God still came through anyway? Please raise your hand today, okay? Like probably more than once in your life. I think sometimes those moments in our lives, we can get stuck in those moments. Um, we're so embarrassed. We're so ashamed. We want to forget them so much. We want to sweep them underneath the rug and, and act almost as if they never happened. I know Christians whose, who, whose growth in the Lord has been stunted by moments like this. And the solution to that, the solution to that is to do what David did. David didn't get stuck in shame. David didn't get stuck in embarrassment. David didn't sweep this underneath the rug. This was what David did. David saw this because God came through David saw this as an opportunity to praise the Lord. Now, I am never going to justify operating in the flesh uh, because God will come through anyway, all right? That's, that's a, always a bad argument to make. But let me tell you something. When God comes through, even in the midst of our failure, let me tell you what he deserves. He deserves the praise, and David takes this whole moment and he, he calls the whole congregation. This is what the psalm is about. This is a congregational call to praise the Lord. And I believe that's what God wants at Calvary Chapel Las Vegas this weekend. This is a congregational call to praise the Lord. Now, there are three reasons, three reasons why we together ought to be praising the Lord as we see this in David's life. Number one is this. It's a call to praise because God is great. Notice in verse 1, he says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall what? Shall, shall what? Say it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Out loud, not to yourself. His praise shall continually, continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us. All right. Number one, we are called to praise because our God is great. David praised not because his circumstances were great. Listen, David praised not because his circumstances were great, but because his God was great. You know, there is a, there is a reason, there is a justification for us to praise God that exceeds the circumstances in our lives. Think about the words that David uses here. He says, I will bless, I will boast, I will magnify, I will exalt the word Lord in these few verses in this psalm is used 16 times. So as David is reflecting on this moment that really probably was an embarrassment to him, he draws the attention and the focus to God. And the exclamation that David has for the congregation of Israel is simply this, God is great. As you consider the attributes and the qualities and the characteristics of God, the conclusion is this, there is no one like him. And I'm not talking just about what God does. I want you to set that to the side just for a minute, because a lot of times, and rightfully so, but not limited to this, a lot of times um, our evaluation or our estimation of God's greatness is connected only to what he does. And while, while that is true, we don't just value God or esteem Him or exalt Him or praise Him because of what He's done. We, we do so because of who He is, all right? Think about this uh, when you think of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ the Lord. That's how He's presented in the Scriptures. He is Jesus, He is the Christ, and He is the Lord. Jesus, the name Jesus uh, means this, it's a compound word, Yeshua, it means God is salvation. We worship him because God has become salvation. He's handled our salvation through the son, through the sacrifice of the son. There's an opportunity for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what Jesus means. He is the Christ. He is the anointed. He is the one that God has chosen. There is no salvation in any other name. There's only one name given among men by which we must be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. He is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is also the Lord. We worship him because he settled our salvation. 
We worship him because he is the unique, anointed, chosen of God. We worship him as well because he is the Lord and there is none like him. God is unparalleled. God is incomparable. God is unequaled. God is unrivaled. God is absolutely unique and there is only one God. I don't just mean numerically. That is absolutely true. There is only one God in number, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is only one God in quality, in character. He is absolutely unique. I want you to, I want you to think about this. Think about these verses today. They're, they're just so good. Uh, and they're up on the screen for you. Jeremiah 10, 6. This is just awesome. Inasmuch, this is what Jeremiah says, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, parentheses, you are great and your name is great in might. Somebody say amen to that. Like, I don't know what this does to you. If this does not stir your heart, you are spiritually dead. Okay? Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your rightful due. Not just because of what you've done, but because of who you are. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Why do you worship him today? First Chronicles 29, 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Why do you worship? Why do you worship him today? Listen, we, we have a congregational call to praise because God is great. And, and we are compelled to magnify this. This is what David says, bring this into focus. Bring the greatness of God into focus. You say, well, what's in it for me? Because you know that's how we are as Christians. In this current Christian culture, sorry to be negative today, but let me tell you the truth. We are so narcissistic. We are so consumer-oriented. It is all about us all of the time. And today... The truth is this, I want you to get, I want you to receive, I want you to understand all that God has done for you, and I want you to respond in praise because of that, but you know there's a, there's a higher call to praise. There's a higher call to praise for those who mature past that. We praise Him because of who He is, and you know what? This is an anchor for you. The greatness of God is an anchor in your life. Why is it an anchor in your life? Because it leads you to real worship. When you recognize who God is, you come in and you give him praise. You give him praise not just because of what he is doing in your life. You're not just bound in this conditional response to God. By that I mean this. You don't just worship God when it feels good. You don't just worship or praise God when he's doing what you want him to do. You worship and praise him because of who he is. It compels you to surrender. When you consider the greatness of God, listen, you understand how unparalleled, how unrivaled, how absolutely awesome he is. This is why you love the hymns. You're drawn to the hymns not because of the melody or the harmony, but because of the lyrics. And the lyrics are so doctrinally solid, and they express the qualities, characteristics, and attributes of God. And when you see him for who he is, you know your right place. Just as Jeremiah said, this is your rightful due. When you acknowledge the greatness of God and he is at the center of your life, it compels you to surrender. It takes you beyond yourself. Look, we live in a world, we're saturated by the things of this world, we're, we're influenced uh, by the world around us. We live this lateral life and when you look to God who is greater than all of that, it puts the world in its appropriate place. It enables you to see the world for what it is. I think that, in addition, when you see God for who he is, it cuts off the hold that the world and the things of this world has on your life. It gives you reason and purpose for living. You have confidence in him. You have confidence in him. You know God has been faithful. Has God ever let you down? Ever once? Ever once? He's never let you down. So look, are you waiting day by day? You know, well, he hasn't yet. He hasn't yet, but who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Some of you have this conditional approach to God. 
when you focus and magnify the greatness of God, there's a confidence that comes into your life where you're able to say this, not only has he never failed me, he will never fail me because it is impossible. It's impossible for God to fail. And then in addition to that, the, the final thing is this, why, it is an, why is it an anchor? Um, because in the midst of it, you're able to say, no matter what happens in my life, I will still. No matter what happens in my life, I will still. No matter whether the gifts that I'm receiving feel good or the challenges that I'm receiving hurt my heart, no matter what comes into my life, I will still worship him because my God is great. The brilliant Stephen Hawking uh, died this last week, and uh, you know, one of the brightest, uh, most intellectual minds ever made by God. And let me tell you something, his mind was made by God, and that man is now aware of how great God is. We have a call to praise because God is great. We have a call to praise because God delivers. Verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me. Psalm 34, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him. We're talking about the people who trust God. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And then I just notice verse 7, because David is granted insight here. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. The, the, the second reason today, congregational call to praise. Congregational call to praise. We're called to, to magnify, to boast in him, to exalt him. And the second reason is this, because God delivers. David praised God because he learned that God was working in the unseen world. He learned in this moment, in this experience, as a young man, that ultimately God was at work, even when he couldn't see it. You know, the bottom line for David as he looks back is this, God did it, man. It was a simple prayer. And who knows what David prayed? You know, God can answer any prayer. Sometimes the shorter ones are the, are the better ones, like Peter when he was sinking and he just simply said, help me, Lord. You know, how many, how many times did you cry that one this week? <laughs> help me, Lord. And you know, in the, in the moment, David simply cries out, to the Lord in his poverty, in his inability, and this was what happened. God showed up. God showed up. God showed up when David didn't see it. Look, my, my opinion, so take it or leave it today, I think David was operating in the flesh. I think David was evaluating in the flesh. This is the circumstance. I've got to do something. You know, have you ever felt like that? Compelled to to just do something and, and you know, nine times out of ten you're doing something makes the problem worse. It just magnifies the problem. David does do something in the midst of it. God is gracious and David learns that in the unseen world, this is what trust is all about. You go through things, you're in the midst of a situation, you're evaluating it in the flesh, you're a control freak. Raise your hand today. You're a control freak, and so, like, you think you have to manage it and fix it and make it better and resolve it, and you're forgetting in all of that that in the unseen world, God is at work. God is at work, and God is waiting for an opportunity to show himself strong on your behalf, and this is what David learns. David learns that the truth of the matter is the angel of the Lord. Remember, Bible students, every time you see the name angel of the Lord. We're talking about a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the triune Godhead, Jesus Christ. And so David's, David's experience learns him, and this is what he learns, that the second person of the triune Godhead is always encamped around those who love him and fear him. Jesus Christ is always encamped. The word encamped is a military term, and it was used when uh, soldiers would gather in a circle to protect something that was in the center. You know, our, our semi-modern equivalent would be back in the day uh, when the covered wagons were heading from the east to the west. At nighttime, they would circle the wagons, and the women and the children would be in the middle. And, you know, the men would be on the outer ring. They would be on the perimeter protecting. This is the imagery that David has as he's thinking about what God did. The angel of the Lord has set up his encampment. He is 
protecting you. He has surrounded you. Listen, nothing gets to you that doesn't go through him first. Nothing gets to you. This is the truth for a believer in Jesus Christ. Nothing gets to you that doesn't go through him first. He has set up his encampment. He is protecting and preserving you. Think about, and, and all of this in the unseen realm, all of this in the unseen realm, this is where we learn to look to the word of God and trust in what God says. Well, pastor, I don't feel it. Pastor, I don't see it. That's why you, you've got to go to the scriptures and believe it by faith. Think about all of the things that God affords to those who love him. And I'm talking today about those who have a personal relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, who have confessed their sins and turned to Christ in faith. Think about this, all right? Just go through the scriptures with me. Verse 15. This is true for you. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. You're righteous as you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Verse 15, his ears are open to their cry. Uh, verse 17, the righteous cry out, and what happens? And in that same verse, and delivers them out of all their troubles. Verse 18, the Lord is near. Verse 19, at the end, the Lord delivers him. Verse 20, he guards all his bones. Verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. So be encouraged today. You may not see it. There may be times where you don't feel it, but the Bible says this, for the child of God, God's eyes are on you, God's ears are open to you, he hears, he's near, he saves, he delivers, he guards, and he redeems. God cares about you. God cares about you. You may feel like you're all alone, you're on an island, you've been marginalized, you've been insulated. Well, guess what? John was too on the island of Patmos. And there was one like the son of man who was with him, Jesus Christ. Or Paul, when he was shipwrecked on Malta, you remember, before the ship was broken into pieces, the Lord himself came to Paul and said, Paul, do not be afraid. Or you think of Stephen. He was the first martyr of the church. And as he was being stoned to death, Christ was with him. As he looked up into the heavens, the heavens were opened. And there Jesus Christ was standing at the right hand of God the Father, ready to receive this child of God. He is with you no matter what. You may feel like you're all alone, but I want to tell you today, you are not. You are not alone. Christ said this to his disciples in the Great Commission, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. This is where you and I need to set aside our feelings and emotions that so often lie to us. And if we're not careful, you know those feelings, if they go unchecked by the word of God, they drive us down into the pit of despondency and despair and hopelessness. This is when you need to be reminded, God is with you. And if God is with you, who can be against you? There is an alternative as well here in these verses for the unrighteous, for the person who stands against God for the person who stands against those things that God loves, for the person who loves those things that God hates, for the person who believes themselves to be in a position of neutrality. You think today, well, you know what? No, I'm not a Christian. You know, I'm not really for God, but I'm not against him either. It's not like, it's not like, uh, I, I'm kind of like Switzerland. You know, I'm neutral. I'm just, I'm right in the middle. And the Bible says that there is no neutrality. There is no neutrality. You are either for him or you are against him. You're either a friend of God or you're a foe. And the scripture here teaches that in that day, your evil will slay you. Your evil will slay you. God loves you. God desires a personal relationship with you. You know, religion so often makes things complicated. We boil down this Supposed interaction with God if we're religious to a place, to a priesthood, to a process, to a liturgy, uh, to motions that we go through. We have this view possibly that God is some impersonal God. No, God is a personal God and he has a plan for your life and he loves you and this is what he is after. He's not after your performance. He is after your heart. He's after your heart. The third reason to praise him today is this. Um, we are called congregationally to praise God because God is good. Verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Somebody say amen. amen. 
blessed is the man uh, or the woman, blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you as saints. There's no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Congregational call to praise today, all right? Um, and I mean all of us, all of us. I don't know uh, where you're at today, but I'm giving you reasons today to respond to, to God in praise. And the third reason is this, because God is good. Because God is good. We praise him because he's great. We praise him because he delivers, even in the midst of our own failure. And we praise him because with the, the bottom line is this, our God is good. David praised God, not only because God saves, but because God also satisfies. God not only saves you, but God satisfies you. Isn't that true? You know, is your experience with God just related to one point in time, one moment, uh, where you responded to the gospel, and you raised your hand, or you came forward, and that was your experience, and your experience ended there? Was that the way it worked for you? Was that, was that the end of the beginning? Or the beginning of the end? Or for you, was it like the door opened? The door opened to this glorious relationship with God where, yeah, God saved you. And now, as you've walked with God, he day by day satisfies your soul. He day by day meets your needs. He day by day shows himself strong on your behalf. He day by day gives you things that the world will never be able to give you. This is what David says. David says, taste and see. Taste and see. You have to have your own personal experience. That's the call of the scripture today. God is not looking for you to have some experience with him through somebody else or through some religious church system. God wants you. God wants you to have an existential, subjective, personal experience with him. And I don't mean when, when he says taste, he's not talking about just nibbling you know, a little, little bite, and then that's it. He's talking about taking a bite and then being so engaged and so intrigued and so enthralled that you begin to feed on him. You feed on the Lord. You feed on your experiences with him. You take one bite and you can't stop. I'm thankful that David does not say, oh, see that the Lord is good. He doesn't say that. He doesn't give the implication that you can have this experience with God from a distance or from afar. No, to really see uh, from a spiritual perspective that God is good, you yourself have to take a bite. It's not just knowing about God. It's, a, it's knowing him personally. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people gathered in churches this weekend who know a lot about God. They've had an intellectual experience with him. An intellectual experience that has not touched their soul or touched their spirit. But for those who are born again, you know, born again Christians, I'm telling you. I, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before. The, the guy who led me to the Lord uh, in college was a born again Christian. And, uh, you know, I knew enough about born again Christians at that point in time in my life where I wanted nothing to do with them. Because they were just so fanatical. They were just crazy. And, uh, and so this guy was my roommate, and, and I remember telling my friends, I'm like, this guy's not just a Christian, he's a born-againer. You know those born-againers. They're just fanatical. They're just nuts. They're just crazy. What is it about these people? Well, let me tell you what it is about these people. And this is you. If you're sitting here today and you're like, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not born again. You got a problem. You got a problem. He says it himself. You will not see the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. What is it about born-again Christians? Let me tell you what it is. They've tasted. They've experienced. They know God is real. Their life has been transformed. They're crazy about Jesus Christ. That's, that's what the deal is. You look at Saul, Saul of Tarsus, and from a leadership perspective, it's really easy to take Saul and say, Saul Paul, it's easy to take him and say, well, we want to be like that. So let's evaluate. Let's do a, a Gallup strength test on Paul. What really made him tick? What really drove Paul, you know, what was in his toolbox that made him the leader that he was? Why was he so fanatical? Why was he so compelled? Why was he so relentless? Let me tell you something. He was so relentless because he had a personal experience. He himself tasted and he himself saw that the Lord is good. 
And nothing was going to stop him from telling other people about it. Are you fanatical for the Lord today? Are you fanatical? Are you a fan? You know, are you more excited about your NCAA bracket than you are about Jesus Christ? You know, I want you just to think it through. Have you tasted and, and have you seen that the Lord is good? I've got, um, I've got some Oreos today. I've got Oreos. This is not communion today, so don't like get all, get all freaked out. Don't you love how, how Oreo now does this little thing right here? This is so dangerous, all right? This is like, this can be a matter of life and death right here. They've made it so simple. But I, I want you to think about this Oreo cookie, all right? Um, may, maybe you've never had an Oreo cookie before. Say, for the sake of the illustration, you've never had an Oreo cookie before. Someone hands you this cookie. And, uh, and you, you, you can... Assume some things about this cookie. It's, it's good just because it's called a cookie, right? I mean, everything that's called a cookie is, is good. So it's a cookie, so it starts off as good, even though you've never tasted it before. But as you hold it, you're like, hey, we've got two chocolate uh, wafers on the outside. They're nice and crisp. They feel nice and crisp. Those have to be good. And then there's this nice vanilla cream on the inside in the middle, right? Some of you are double stuffers, and so you like the thick ones. Um, I didn't get those for you today. So, so you know, just by holding it and looking at it, um, it's called a cookie. It's got chocolate and vanilla. Um, everything that's chocolate is good. So you can, you can probably talk almost as an expert about how good this is. Then you hear other people talk about the Oreo cookie. And you know, as people are talking about this Oreo cookie, how good it must be because of the testimony of other people. But all of this is just intellectual, right? You can probably even act like an expert. But the truth is this, you don't know. You don't know until, hmm. you don't know until you taste, man, that's good, right? And when you taste, something happens. Can I explain it to you now? You start to salivate. Some of you, some of you are salivating right now. You're like, I want a cookie. You salivate. Your whole body's having this experience. Endorphins are exploding. You've tasted how crisp and how perfectly the wafers are cooked. The vanilla is just so smooth on the inside. And you want to finish this and you want to dig in for more. You want, you want more Oreo cookies because one is not enough, right? Amen. This is what happens when you taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste, when you bite into the Lord... Your whole body is engaged. You have this experience. And there's a, there is an infinity of difference. There's a, an eternal difference between somebody who has an intellectual experience but has never tasted. Someone who's a pretender as opposed to somebody who's a partaker. I think there's a lot of pretenders in the church today. I think there are a lot of pretenders who don't know they're pretenders. I think there are a lot of people who who've made an evaluation. They can talk about church and they can talk about God and they've seen what God can do and in some sense it's even touched them. It's even touched them. They can sound like an expert and they don't even know it, but they themselves have never even tasted. They've never tasted. Their whole being has not been consumed by. There's not this drive and this desire and this pursuit for more. Because they've experienced the goodness of God themselves. Do you understand there is an eternity of difference between these two people? To come so close, to come so close, but to be an eternity away. God does not want that for you. God wants you to taste and see that he is good. The goodness of God is a moral quality that disposes him to be benevolent. It's what compels him to bless us. God blesses you because the nature of God is good. His heart towards you is good. We say this, God is good, right? God is good all the time. God is good. Have you experienced that yourself? Have you tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord? David said this in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those who have tasted know they're blessed. They have need of nothing. The Lord is their shepherd. 
and he will not withhold any good thing from them. Praise him, church. Praise him today. Praise him because he's great. Praise him because he delivers. And praise him because he's good. Father, we're thankful, God, today for your word. And God, we give you the praise today. We magnify your name. And we pray that you'd move among us now, that you'd work by your Holy Spirit. God, that you would reveal the true condition of our heart. This morning, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, the most dangerous place a person can ever be is to have a knowledge of God, but to have never really experienced Him personally. And maybe the Spirit of God has been touching your heart today. God doesn't want you just to experience Him through other people or being present in the place where His people are gathering. God wants you. He wants your heart. He knows you. He knows every circumstance, every situation. And He's been calling you, drawing you to Himself, revealing Himself to you. And today, you need to take a step of faith. Today, you need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Today, you need to come yourself and confess your sin and turn to Christ who is and desires to be your salvation, the anointed of God. He is the Lord. Today, will you let God do these things in your life? Don't miss eternity. Don't miss eternal life with God because you never took this step of faith. And so this morning, while our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, right? We are sitting today. If this is you and, and, and the reality is you want to make sure, maybe you're unsure today, you need to leave this place with confidence that you belong to God and you need to take a step of faith. And turn your heart to Jesus Christ. And so if this is you today, would you raise your hand? God's tugging on your heart. I want to pray for you this morning. Get your hand up high. God bless you here in the center. God bless you. I see the three of you right here. Anybody else? Raise your hand today. You need to take that step of faith. You need to look to God for salvation. You want that personal experience with him over here in the back on my right. Thank you for raising your hand. Anybody else? Raise your hand right now. Respond to him. Don't let anything hold you back. God is calling you by name today, and he's been ministering to you by the power of his Holy Spirit. One more moment, briefly today. Get your hand up high. You know, if you're a Christian today and you've been maybe backslidden, you've not been walking with the Lord, you've not been really engaged, surrendered, submitted to the greatness of God, and, and that needs to be fixed today. You need to take a step of faith. You need to give God what He deserves, not only because of what He's done, but because of who He is. This morning, would you raise your hand? Let me see who you are. You need to rededicate your life to Christ. God bless you here in the center. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I see your hand too. Thank you. All right. Father, thank you. God, thank you for each of these today and the work of your Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, only you can answer these prayers and only you can pour yourself into these hearts. And so we just ask that you by grace would do that. Right where you guys are sitting today, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And um, prayer is how you communicate with God. So you're just talking to him. This is beginning your relationship with him. I want to lead you. I want to guide you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of confession, acknowledging to God that you've sinned against him, owning that, which is God's desire. This is the first step to forgiveness. And it's a prayer of trust and faith in Jesus Christ, turning to Jesus and depending upon him for the saving of your soul. So right where you're sitting today, I want to lead you in this prayer. 
Make this your prayer to God. Dear God, today I give you my life. God, I confess I've sinned against you. God, I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your Son, my Savior, believing that He died for me and that He rose again. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you followed me in prayer today, welcome to the family of God. We're going to have communion this morning. Our ushers are going to come forward today, please. uh, As the elements are passed out, please take both cups, hold them. We will take communion together. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your heart in the streams of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. In the waves of his mercy, his deep cries out to thee, we sing, come, Lord, Jesus, come, we sing, come. God, we give you praise today. So thankful. God, we're thankful. Our hearts have been conquered by your love. God, you are good. You've delivered us. And you are unlike any other. God, you are unrivaled. 
And we praise you today. God, your people give you praise. Lord, we long for heaven where we will praise you for all of eternity. God, receive this now from our hearts as we remember the sacrifice that, that you gave for us, delivering your own son for our sin. God, thank you today for the forgiveness you've given, the adoption into your family, and the gift of everlasting life. Let's take the bread together. Let's take the cup. Oh God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said. <clears throat> if you need prayer today, we have prayer uh, elders right outside of the doors here. So on your way out, get some prayer. Our missionaries are out there. The donuts are out there. The Oreos are up here. God bless you guys. <laughs>